So here we are at question 19. This question is on radioactivity and photoelectric effect. And they start by asking us to define half-life as used in radioactivity. Half-life is the time taken by the number for the number of radioactive nucleides present in a sample to reduce to half its original value. When that happens, since the activity of an element or a sample is directly proportional to the number of radioactive nucleides present, so we can also define a half-life as the time taken for the activity of a given sample to reduce to half its original activity. So those two ways they can be used to define half-life. However, let's stick to the standard definition of half-life, the time taken for half the number of radioactive nucleides initially present in a radioactive sample to decay. All right, let's look at uh, part B. In part B, it's a method of detection of uh, radioactivity. Figure 13 shows a device used to detect radioactivity by performing by forming tracks when air is ionized. We want to know state the name of the device shown. Uh, this device is referred to as an expansion cloud chamber. Expansion cloud chamber. This is how it works. Uh, this is the radioactive sample. It emits radiation. That radiation is going to ionize. Uh, this uh, air here or if it is um, maybe moisture alcohol moisture it's going to ionize the molecules here let's suppose that it is air molecules it's going to uh, ionize the air molecules and then at the same time this piston will move downwards causing the air to expand when the air expands it's going to cool down and when it cools down, the moisture is going to condense around the ionized air particles inside here. And therefore, it's going to render them visible. And therefore, the track, uh, that, that track will clearly be seen. That's how it works. So let's uh, look at the next question. Question, state how the air in the device gets ionized. I've already explained that. When the radioactive element emits radiation into the chamber, the air inside is ionized. So we want to explain how this happens. The radiation removes electrons from neutral air molecules, thus making them to get ionized. When a neutral air molecule loses an electron, it becomes positively charged. If a neutral air molecule gains an electron, it becomes negatively charged. So, uh, if radiation is a beta particle, the electron, which is actually the beta particle, attaches, attaches itself onto a neutral air molecule, thus making it to be negatively charged. For the other radiation, such as the alpha particles, Alpha particles are going to reap electrons from neutral air molecules and make them positively charged. So that is how the air gets charged. Let's look at the next question. Number three, describe how the tracks are formed. I've already explained this. When the air gets ionized, in other words, when the air molecules here become charged particles, um, by the radiation simultaneously the piston moves down making the air inside here to expand and cool down the moisture is going to condense around because over here we've got vapor inside here we've got vapor that vapor is going to condense around the ionized gas particles and this will make them appear to be like clouds, like smoke. So it will make the tracks or the path of the radiations visible. 
and uh, that's how it works. Let's look at uh, the points. After the air gets ionized and the piston is now moved down suddenly, air in the chamber will expand and cool, cooling occurs. That's very important. The air inside expands because the volume has increased. The air expands, it cools down. Once it cools down, what happens? When this happens, the ions formed act as nuclei on which the saturated alcohol or water vapor condenses. So the water vapor, you find that over here, there is vapor inside here. So that vapor, whether it is alcohol vapor or water vapor, is going to condense around those charged uh, air molecules and therefore rendering them visible and therefore their tracks can be seen. Uh, next, uh, part C, this one is on photoelectrons, photoelectricity or photoelectric effect. State two factors that determine the speed of photoelectrons emitted from the metal surface. Of course, one of them is the energy of the incident radiation which is determined by the frequency of the incident radiation. When the frequency is high, then the energy of the incident radiation is going to be high, and therefore the electrons emitted are going to be emitted with high speed. High speed. How is that possible? The energy of the emitted of the incident radiation is used to provide the work function of the metal. And uh, because the work function has a constant value, the greater the energy of the incident radiation, the more will be the excess energy which remains after the work function has been provided. This excess energy is converted into the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. That is how the speed of the photoelectrons emitted uh, of the photoelectrons which are emitted can either be increased or decreased. We increase their speeds by increasing the energy of the incident radiation. Another way of increasing the emitted, uh, the speed of the emitted electrons, or to vary the speed of the emitted electrons, is to to increase the potential between the anode and the cathode. If the potential is such that it tends to accelerate the electrons, the electrons are going to be to move with a higher speed if that voltage is high. But if the potential is such that it opposes the, the, the movement of the electrons by connecting the positive part of the potential to the cathode, then the speed is going to be reduced. Either way, you can see that the potential across the anode and the cathode affects the speed of the emitted photoelectrons as well as the energy of the incident radiation. So here, there are those two points, the energy of the incident radiation, increasing the frequency of the incident radiation increases the energy of the incident radiation, which in turn increases the speed of the emitted photoelectrons because the excess energy above the work function of the metal is converted into kinetic energy of the electrons. So the more the energy of the incident radiation, the more will be the excess energy. And of course, number two is the potential difference between the cathode and the anode, which I have already explained. Another factor which affects the speed of emitted electrons is the position of the electron in the metal. You know that electron in the metal, when it gets emitted, this is what happens. This is the metal surface. Assume this is the metal surface. There is that energy of the incident radiation, which is HF. We could have two electrons. We could have one electron, which is closer to the metal surface here. And therefore, as soon as we subtract the work function from the energy of the from the energy of the incident photon, it uses the rest of it 
to get the kinetic energy. Now, we could have that electron in the metal like this. It is far much deeper into the metal. When this electron subtracts, when we subtract the work function from this, the energy which is supposed to be given to the electron as kinetic energy is absorbed by the electron and the electron starts moving. But on its way to the surface, because of the distances involved and because of the collisions which are likely to take place, it's going to lose some of that kinetic energy and by the time it gets to the surface, it doesn't have a lot of kinetic energy. So it leaves the metal surface with less kinetic energy. And because kinetic energy is given by a half mass of the electron times the speed of the electron squared, you can see that the speed of the electron is determined by the amount of kinetic energy which eventually it has at this point. And that is why the position of the electron in the metal also determines how much kinetic energy that electron is going to leave the metal with and hence the speed because we are looking at factors that determine or affect the speed of the photoelectron emitted from a metal surface. So we could also add that third point. Let's look at uh, part C, part 2, where we are told the energy of a photon of light is 2.21 electron volts. And we are told that one electron volt is 1.6 by 10 raised to the power 19 joules. And the Planck's constant is 6.63 by 10 raised to minus 34 joule seconds. We are asked to express the energy of the photoelectron in joules. And this is how we do it. So we are going to say that uh, 2.21 electron volts is the same as 2.21. We multiply that by 1.6 by 10 raised to power minus 19 juice and this is going to give me I'm just going to multiply 2.21 by 1.6 because I know the power remains the same so this one becomes 3.536 by 10 raised to the power minus 19 juice that's how I convert electron volts into joules. You j just need to multiply by the value of the electronic charge, which is 1.6 by 10 raised to my power minus 19 joules. And then, uh, part two, that was part one. Part 2, we are supposed to determine the frequency of light that produces the photon. The energy of this photon is given by HF, where F is the frequency, H is a Planck's constant, and E is the energy. We've already worked out this energy, so the frequency is going to be equal to the energy divided by Planck's constant. So the energy is 3.536 by 10 raised to power minus 19 juice, while Planck's constant is 6.63 by 10 minus 34 joules seconds you can see that juice and juice are going to cancel out and the answer we are going to get will be in per second which is the SI unit of frequency so what I'm going to do I'm just going to divide 
0.536 I divide by 6.63 and that gives me 0 0.533 0 0.533 by 10 raised to power there is a 34 when 34 now becomes a numerator it becomes positive and I have to subtract 19 and they get power 15 per second and this implies this is like 5.33 by 10 raised to power 14 has and that is how we work out the frequency of the light that produces uh, the photons. And that brings us to the end of this paper. It has been quite a long paper. I'd like to encourage you, if you are not a member of my channel yet, go ahead, subscribe, because uh, this is the way I've decided to be looking at these past papers. I look at a complete uh, paper. It may, may be long, yes, but I've also given you an opportunity to, the, to go to the question of your choice. I've provided you with the timestamps for each question. If you, if you put your cursor over the scroll bar, you'll be able to identify various questions that you're interested in. Go directly to those questions. If, for instance, you find maybe question number two is much, much easier, it's not worth checking, you go to the question of your choice. Although initially, I will encourage you to go through the whole paper. I want to thank you for having the patience to go through this over two hour video. And I have no doubt that it has benefited you. Go right ahead, leave some comments below this particular video, share it with your friends, and if you're not a member of my channel, just take time and uh, subscribe because there's a lot that you learn when you're a member of this channel. Otherwise, goodbye. Until next time when I come up with another past paper.